Run, river, run, run through the hills. Run, river, run to the sea. Run, river, run to your place beneath the sun. Run, river, run over me. Hi, this is Jan Lewis. Welcome to be my guest today. We have Senator, State Senator Michael O. Moore with us. Welcome, Senator. Thank you for having me. Good to me. have him on. Nice, he, nice to have This is here. great. You had no problem finding us. No, nope, not at all. No, no. Right off the bat, you have something that's so serious right now, and it's getting more and more the more our ages, our people age. Alzheimer's. Tell us about that. Well, uh, as we were discussing before, before the show, there's, you know, the government is experiencing a, a, a growth in areas that uh, we need to start investing more resources in and a lot of it has to do just with the fact that we have such a good health care system yeah. and that people are living longer and with um, a growing aging population we're now seeing a growth in certain diseases that are impacting those th that demographic and one of them is Alzheimer's. Where was that when our grandparents I don't remember that even being part of the deal well, in that yeah, I think it was part of a deal, but I think it was a very small population. Yeah. Now that we have um, people that more people living to a hundred, yeah, oh yeah, nineties um, and the hundreds. Yeah. So I think there's there's more of an impact, or there's a larger demographic of these individuals who yeah. are being diagnosed with this. That now we have to try to come up with a plan on how we're going to um, give proper medical care and support to the individuals diagnosed with the disease, mm -hmm. then also the individuals who are the caretakers. Yeah, uh, that's exhausting. Yeah, as of right now, uh, in Massachusetts, there are 130,000 people in Massachusetts with Alzheimer's um, disease, supported by 337,000 family givers. Who may be still working, too, and trying to... Yes, so they're working, and then they've got to come home, and then you've got your family member you're trying to take care of. So. These are some of the issues that we have to deal with. What's that place in Worcester? We've had him on. Um, very tall fellow, terrific. He opened this place, the Oasis? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mikkel? Oh, God. Yeah. He actually has a book. Yes. Yes. And it's a great place. I mean, yeah. oh. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. We need places a lot more, don't we? Well, and that's, and that's part of the what this bill that we just passed and, um, and the governor signed. Yeah. It's to look at addressing our long-term planning and, it, and it's from the medical aspect it's to the family caregiver aspect mm -hmm. it's trying to um, have a strategy that we're not reactive we're being yeah. proactive yeah. Um, they're expecting by 2025 nearly 150,000 people in Massachusetts to have um, Alzheimer's and Fewer than 50% of the patients with Alzheimer's are properly diagnosed. So they could be, they might think it's anything, but it's not, you know? Right, yeah. So this could be further compounding the whole thing. So what's the difference between the dementia and the, and the Alzheimer's diagnosis? That's where you'll have to get a, yeah. get a physician into it. Because I get both. People will say, well, that one has this. The yeah. trouble is, is we're saying that the family member who's working during the day and their mom and dad maybe needs the help, but they're not ready to go into any kind of living, right. or maybe they can't afford it, has got to find a way. Some senior centers do have a day program, right? Um, I know Grafton does. Uh, some for, the, for the Alzheimer's? Well, just it? anybody. To, I guess they'll come to the bus and at least. It's a place for them to go during the day, safe, you know, but I don't know if but it's I, Alzheimer's. But I, don't, but, yeah, but I don't think that's geared towards um, providing services to people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. Mm -hmm. They have... All, every senior center usually has day programs, yeah. but that can run from computer class, that could be a, a yoga class, they could yeah. be having bingo, um, yeah. dancing lessons. You know, in one of change that we've seen our senior centers um, evolving into over the last several years is because the... Um, baby, baby boomers? Baby boomers, <laughs> when, you're, when you're turning 60. Yeah you're not looking for that complacent lifestyle anymore. Oh, no. So we see more of the senior centers act, try, yeah. evolving more into a, more of like a uh, community center yeah. or, or an activity center. Yeah. So that's where you're seeing a lot of these day programs and they, they sponsor uh, 
field trips. Oh, you know, they yeah. Go, they go to, down to Foxwoods. They, who knows, maybe they'll be going to Springfield soon. To it's not like our, our, our parents' senior center anymore. And that AARP magazine is not. I used to see it sitting on Mom and Dad's coffee table. I was like, ugh. <laughs> well, and, that, and, and that's why some of them are looking at trying to change the name from senior center. Yeah, to the community center. They did this here in uh, Upton. Well, because you people did not, you had residents who did not want to go to a senior center. Oh. But they would go to it. They would utilize the services at a community center. So um, that is beautiful. That is beautiful. My parents, to the day they died, they would not go to senior centers. I mean, they were very well qualified. They were in their 80s. Yep. But oh no, that bored them. They were both very active. Like no, we don't want to sit there with a cocktail set and go like this. We want to get out and do things. Well, if you think years ago, that's a lot of it was bingo. They're not in. They were not in. Maybe playing cards. Yeah. Now you have the dance classes. You have computer classes that yeah. are going on. Um, so there's a variety of different activities that they coordinate now for their. Members. Worcester has a great one. Worcester Senior Center. Yes. They've got yeah. all kinds of things over there. Yeah. I remember I walked in one time and I, they were kidding with me. I said, I know, I know, I know. I'm not old enough to join your group, but they were so cute. They took me on a tour. They showed me the the uh, pool hall. They showed me all these things with computers on. I'm like, this is cool. Yeah. I mean, if you got something to look forward to, it, it's getting better. You know, you, they're not going to bore us, I don't think. Some of the some of them are still have uh, bingo. Some of them still have the old. Oh, the, oh, yeah, no. Yeah. You you need to service that population who, yeah. um, on his mobile, yeah. as some of their other members now. Yeah. But you know, what's what's well, they talk about today is um, today is sixty. Today is like forty. Yeah, 60s the new 40. Right, and so. you got the Gen Xers right behind baby boomers. Right. And it's coming fast. If you look, you know the obituaries. Every Sunday I check it. Not because I'm morbid, but I like to see, my God, one whole page of the trip, the, the uh, Telegram and Gazette. 90, 100, and then it jumps down to maybe 50 something or whatever. I think that's great. Well, I want to aim for at least 100. Yeah. And you know, if, if the, the older you get, as long as you. Your quality of life is maintained. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's nice that we have these services available. The problem now, again, this is similar to what we're dealing with the Alzheimer's, it's now maintaining a budget or the cities and towns being able to um, afford the services that they that some of the, their residents are now requiring. In Massachusetts and in general, in this country, we have an aging population. Yeah. So but are they willing to open the purse strings and help out? Uh, some are, some are. It, uh, it all depends on the the uh, the, the senior centers, the, and the 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 economy at the time, and the fiscal situation of each town. Yeah. You know, when we had the Great Recession several yeah. years ago, yeah. when the state, I literally got sworn in, and within five minutes, I was voting to cut a billion dollars from the budget. Now, at that point, um, <laughs> we're fighting to maintain. Yeah. Um, line items for the cities and towns. So unless there's a revenue source that's coming in, yeah. um, you know, for us to, to provide the resources, yeah. you know, the cities and towns have to do it on their own. Yeah. So they need to, if they, they need to develop a source, they, uh, whether it's a donation or whether mm -hmm. it's a some sort of uh, funding in town. Some some communities adopted when we increased the sales tax. We went to six and a quarter. Yeah. Um, we also. And this was a recommendation from the uh, cities and towns. We allowed for a local option to go to seven percent. Now the city on the the city of town could, if they voted in favor of it, adopted mm -hmm. it, they could have that sales tax go to seven percent. But they kept yeah. the difference between six and a quarter and seven. Yeah. And you know, there's many communities that did adopt it, and there, yeah. there was many that didn't. We have three, well, when you when you were when you came in and you just been sworn in, and suddenly this thing tanks. And you have got to, what, get rid of, X out so many things, and you must not have, the constituents must have been absolutely livid. Oh, they, you know, the people were very angry. Um, so you're walking into a situation where when you're running for office, your goal is to try to be supportive, yeah. try to, you want to improve programs, uh, you, you're not looking just to expand government, but you want to make sure that what you're offering is um, a quality program, what uh, tax dollars are being spent efficiently and wisely. Um, and then you have this happen, and when you're looking at funding for senior centers or, or libraries where this is situated, yep. yeah. and you're cutting the funding, and then you have to go back to then you have to go back to the cities and towns, and they they've got to figure it out on the local level. 
Uh, it's hard. It's We're talking with State Senator Robert. Oh, Mike. Did Michael. I get it right? Michael Omar. Why do I want to say Robert? And I had asked him when he came in, was that your father, Mr. Moore, who was, he was from Uxbridge, right? Yes, yeah. I thought, well, maybe. It, it's not. It it's not, but I thought maybe he'd pass the torch to us. Is he still with us? He's still around, right? Well, yeah, he's still around. He's actually, um, he's working with, I believe, a senior advocacy group. He's advocating for a, a senior a organization. Yeah. yeah. How so, can people reach you, Senator? Uh, my office number is 617-722-1485. My email is michael.moore at masenate.gov. Yeah. If you have any questions at all, right, feel yep, free. Feel, yep, feel free to call. And you, I've seen your picture in many different events in the newspaper. You're not, you're not just sitting on the sidelines. You are in there. No, I, you know, it's uh, funny. I was at several events last night, and I had someone commenting to me about, yes. I think they used the word, I'm killing it. I'm at so many different oh, things. You are, but that's good. Oh, you know, it, in actually the best, I should say the best part, one of the benefits about it is the fact that you're getting to interact with people in an informal way. It's not the traditional, okay, let's set up a meeting. We, we, sit, we sit in my office, so we sit at the senior center. Yeah. Um, I will try to go to the, the people at, and meet them at the location convenient, right. convenient to them. But when you're out at a at a large fun, at a large, excuse me at a large function or a forum right. and you get to hear people talk or just off the cuff saying oh you know we yeah. get this problem going on with this mm -hmm. it, it, there's so much you can learn yeah. from just hearing people Picking talking it up. Yeah, just, yeah, just hearing them talk informally let them go i see you've got <laughs> you got cheater glasses right yes well yesterday <clears throat> usually i have my glasses on yesterday I, I was in the bathroom and i heard this crunch I'd squashed my my glasses, so they're hopefully getting fixed. But I don't like buying cheaters, you know. Well, this actually is the, prescri the prescription pair. Oh. I had my cheaters on on the, the oh okay the car. <laughs> yeah. I had them on my head. I had to remember to take them off. You gotta like <laughs> yes <laughs> like this. Tell us more about now. What are we doing to help with this Alzheimer's for the day? You're trying to help the people who are caretaking to have a place for their loved one to go. Yeah. So what 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 the legislation actually um, does? It tasks the Executive Office of Health and Human Services to develop and assess all state programs that address Alzheimer's and create recommendations and implementation steps to address issues related to Alzheimer's. It creates an advisory council for the Alzheimer's disease and research treatment, requires that all protective service caseworkers receive training on recognizing signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's. <coughs> Requiring, it also requires that all doctors, physicians assistants, and nurses who serve adult populations complete a one-time course of training on diagnosis, treatment, and care of people with Alzheimer's. It requires physicians to report all initial diagnoses of Alzheimer's to a member of a patient's family or personal representative, and it provides that family, and it provides a family with information about understanding the diagnosis, creating care plans, and accessing medical and non-medical treatment options. It also requires hospitals to create and implement operational plans for the recognition of patients with Alzheimer's, dementia, and the treatment for those patients. What are we doing to help? Let's just say you're not a family that has a lot of wealth. A person maybe in my group, 40s, 50s, whatever. Now they got mom, well, mom or dad, and they've got Alzheimer's. Somebody's gotta be with them all day. Person give up their job, but then what do you do with income? How do you help? Uh, I don't get well, that's a, hopefully a part of the plans that we put together. Yeah. Um, it would allow counseling services yeah. so that if you are in that situation, when you're informed by the physician, the person's primary care physician, yeah. um, <clears throat> that the individual is has this diagnosis, yeah. that they will be able to have referral services for you. That, okay. that so they you. can steer you. Your, your prime, the main thing is to get, as you're saying, the nurses and the docs on board right up and to take a what did you say a one-day class on this a one-time class a one-time class yeah. on it what would that be like would they go to Boston Worcester or well that, that's something that health and human services is going to have to develop with the with the healthcare industry how soon do you think that might happen um, I'd have to go back look at the legislation for the deadline I'm sure there's a deadline date in there that is fantastic because if they can just notice the symptoms sooner then they can help the family I'm just concerned my father took care of my mother he, he wasn't going to jump ship they had the money, they could have gone to assisted living. Oh, I'm going down with the shit. And he did. He burned out taking care of my mother. She didn't have Alzheimer's, but you know, her health was going. And uh, 
I wished like crazy that they, they could have stayed, that they did in their home, but God, somebody could have come in and helped him out. You know, one thing I found since, <clears throat> since being in office that there are many programs, beneficial programs, that the state has to offer that people don't realize are there. Yeah. Um, the state does, unlike a private business, the state doesn't do a great job of marketing. We don't put money aside and say, okay, we're going to buy radio time and we're going to buy TV time and advertise to people. Why? That we have, Why? Well, because that, that, mon that money was, is, is a, uh, it's a very um, hard fought after resource that uh, you've got other programs always fighting for that. Yeah. That, they don't, that hopefully, you know, that instead of seeing a radio ad or a TV ad, they want that money spent on supporting it could be a child with developmental disabilities. So there are places out there that people, can they call your office and find out more? Yeah, yeah. yeah Tell yeah. them again how they can okay. reach you. Um, my office number is 617-722-1485. Um, and email is michael.more at masenate.gov. Uh, email is a great way for us to um, interact uh, just that we have a, this way we have a record a specific record of what your request is I will say this we, we can get anywhere from 100 to 200 emails a day yeah so <laughs> please give us some time <laughs> to respond back but uh, we will get back to you and we'll try to get find out whatever we can find no, if I was talking time. with my millennial kid he's 26 he laughs at emails it's this the text yeah. So in, other, in order to get him to read my email, I've learned how to text, and I'll say, check email. <laughs> he says, you're the only person in the world who does that. I don't know if you're running into this, but they're like in a whole different stratosphere. Yeah, no, it, I mean, the, the way of uh, communicating today is much different than this Snapchat and these... Ah, uh, but there's always the phone. <laughs> yeah, well, you know... <laughs> Kids don't like phones. <laughs> yeah, you gotta. But if you go well, everywhere, they like to talk on them. They like to text on them. And oh yeah, and everywhere you go, Michael, it could be a doctor's waiting room. It could be anywhere. You're sitting there. Everybody. Yeah. Nobody's. Even in a restaurant, they're sitting at the same. They're not. I'm like, uh, uh. I'm not gonna. That's not gonna be the umbilical cord for me. I don't know. I'm just different, I guess. You no, know, technology was supposed uh, to make life simpler. Yeah. Um, and it's not. No. Yeah. Now, people who are finding out <clears throat> that their loved one now has Alzheimer's, they're panicking. Let's say she, he, they're thinking, oh my God, how am I going to work? Where am I going to bring mom? Well, that's what, it, 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 you know, there's a couple aspects. At first, you've got to make sure you're the legal guardian. Yeah. So you have control over the person's um, financial resources. Uh, and then you also want to make sure that you're getting the, the appropriate medical direction. Yeah. So you need, you need to talk to their... Uh, physician, mm -hmm. and you may have to talk to an attorney to go to court to get you know get control of guardianship. Uh, guardianship. Okay. So, uh, but as far as the the healthcare resources, um, I would think it would probably benefit most of us that uh, maybe at the early onset or before that that we sign something where we're giving some sort of release yeah. to whether it's your son, daughter, husband, or someone that's okay. close to you that can help make these make the decisions. decisions for you. But what is out there? I know we were just talking about Oasis. Give them a great plug. Do they have a day program, or is it always you have you live there? <clears throat> which is it? I mean, um, I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm not quite sure which ones have day programs for Alzheimer's. Yeah. Um, that's that's a that's a good question. Because a person might not be quite ready to go yet. But you don't want to leave them home alone because there go the boiled eggs, you know, yeah. up to the ceiling and up goes the stove. Yeah. But they're not quite ready yeah. socially. Well, this is, a, and this is actually, I think, one way that the government has been, um, been able to provide more services is by collaborating with the private sector, where you have um, for-profits and non-profits, like the Oasis, which yeah. I'm not sure if they're a for-profit or non-profit, but that they're providing the, the care. So uh, if we're going to be continuing to see a growth mm -hmm. in this um, demographic or this, this illness, mm -hmm. then you're probably going to see more services start to, start to be opened, uh, especially where if we're, if we're going to have uh, physicians and hospitals and on health board. And on board with this now. We're talking with State Senator Michael O'Moore. Now, <clears throat> another crisis is this opioid yeah. crisis. What, what do you think? 
I just w I was just at the opening of a detox center yesterday in Millbury. It's a private facility. In Millbury? Yeah. What's it's, the name? Uh, Sunrise, um, Sunrise Detox. Okay. Uh, it's a private pay. And oh, they don't take Mass Health and stuff. Well, but they they take Medicare, Medicaid. So. So they do. They yeah. take Mass Health, Medicaid. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they, take, right. they yeah. take the health. Um, but it's when I say funny, it's not funny. Haha. -ha, it's. When I first got elected, before I got elected, I worked at the sheriff's office, and through my experience there, uh, overseeing some of the reentry programs, uh, one thing that, that we had been taught was that opiates or heroin, when it, when nationally we were seeing a decline in it, yeah. decline in this yeah. uh, drug, that was always one of the drugs of choice for Worcester. Yeah. So because it was cheap, and then. Whenever uh, Governor Patrick first declared yeah. the crisis, um, I'll say I was a little. I just found it kind of funny that you know, we've had this problem for a long time. I know. Except now, the difference between then and when he declared it is that the people who were experiencing it weren't the individuals that people normally think of. Yeah. It wasn't just the people in the city of the cities. Yeah on the street, Suburbs homeless, down. it's right, it spiraled down to right now where you had um, individuals who were getting addicted from prescription drugs, yeah. it, uh, people were ODing from that, so it, it had gone outside of the urban areas into the suburbs mm -hmm. and into the, I would say the core of our communities. You know, families. after surgery, they give you, um, which I understand, they give you a Percocet that you're in pain, and you know, <laughs> I know they sent me home with it. I'm like, I don't like it. I don't like the feeling. So, you know, I take it and I'll cut it in half, you know, and get away from, you know, that's it. They'll go to Advil. But the people that do like the sensation, that's what that carries through. And then the doctors now, there's sort of a gag order, watch what you're doing, don't keep doing it. So then that takes the ones who are now addicted. Well, what can I get on the street? Well, and this is, they... You know, it, it, this has taken a long time in getting where we are. Yeah. So it's not something that we're just going to be able to cure overnight. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it took a long time to get here. It's going to take a long time to address the issue. Getting to what you're saying is um, individuals were receiving um, very strong prescriptions. Mm -hmm. um, they could no longer get the prescriptions filled. Yeah. Uh, and when they could, then when they couldn't, like a, a, my understanding is a one pill of Oxy on the street is was going for about a hundred dollars so now if you can't afford to get that anymore is it morphine now or no what they would what they would what they would do is they would then turn to a street drug which would most likely be heroin which you can get for like five to ten dollars i think five is um the average mm -hmm. so instead of paying a hundred yeah. <laughs> they have to, to get that buzz which you no longer afford you're oh. not going to that um so what we've done in the We've done two opiate pieces of legislation um, the last four years. And th in the first one, we tried to address uh, the issue of uh, the healthcare industry with physicians over prescribing. Right. We created a, a prescription monitoring program where the physicians would, when someone comes in, the first version, they, they would voluntarily check to see they'd go to this database see who's been, been prescribed an opiate mm -hmm. or an opiate-based drug yeah. prescription. They would go in there and, okay, he's been doctor shopping. Yeah. He's gone from this doctor, this doctor, this doctor. This ER, this ER. Or the, or the ES. Well, yeah. um, that's a the, tricky fir part. The, the first version was a voluntary um, check by the mm -hmm. physicians. And th the voluntariness wasn't really working. Yeah. So we ended up in the second bill that we just did about a year ago. Uh, it's actually mandatory now that physicians have to go into this. Why database. wouldn't they want to voluntarily do it? That's a good question. <laughs> so, but so you're we, a physician. <laughs> we had to go into. We had to make it mandatory. Yeah. So, um, so they're supposed to check that now. Yeah. We also now with the issue of over prescribing, we've given the patient the authority now that if you get a prescription from a doctor, your physician, ER or whatever, and say it's a thirty day supply. But whatever reason, for whatever reason, you don't think you need that supply. Yeah. You want, say, a two-day or a week. Bring it back. You, you can 
that when you get the prescription filled, yeah. you can tell the pharmacist, I only want two days. Oh, that's a great to know. So you don't have to get that you bottle of 30. <laughs> no, you don't have to get that oh. bottle of 30. Who, who, they sent me home from ankle surgery with, I don't know what it was, the first day or two, yeah, it was, and then bye. So I'm left with, I don't know how many, and they say, don't throw it down the toilet, because yeah. it gets in our water system. You begin wondering, what do I do with it, so. Well, this is where we now have um, drop boxes. Yeah. People can go to the locations where they can go to, whether it's the police station or whatever, wherever the town designates it. Um, oh, I didn't know that. I wonder if Upton has one. Yeah. Um, I'd be surprised if they didn't have some something. Yeah, that's good to know. If you get if you got too many and you're given and you know doggone well you're not going to need that much. That, that that's a question though. How do you? You're not. You're. We're. Well, I think we're, most people know that. No, not going to no, need thirty. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. There's the, always the, Advil. You know. Well, it's like you say. Like I, I had a torn bicep. Yeah. They gave me a prescription. I didn't take any. I just took Advil and all yeah. that. So I never even went and got the prescription filled. Yeah. So I think. Individuals know themselves, so yeah. they know their tolerance levels and what yeah. they kind of can. Yeah, yeah, I don't like that. And, mm. I, and, and you know, you've got some people who um, know they have may have a substance abuse issue, so they don't take it. Then, then hopefully, there's the non there's a generic form that uh, doesn't have the opiate base that can try to address the pain. Well, honesty comes into it so much. You know, if you're a patient and you've had an addiction problem, for God's sake, tell your doctor, so that you're not going to get a bottle of thirty and you're sitting there thinking, what am I going to do with this? Some people, you know, well, start people, selling it. Well, I was going to say, those are people then to go out and sell it. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, and, uh, when I say the sad part about this is that the whole situation is sad, but the fact that you have p individuals who have gone into a medical facility mm -hmm. under the care of a physician or of a healthcare industry, mm -hmm. um, they think they're getting prescribed something, mm -hmm. or they're getting a procedure then prescribed something that's going to help them through it not having the um, smallest idea or clue that what's being prescribed to them could eventually lead them down this road. Yeah. And then, you know, six months later, they, they, they're fighting this issue. Do you think that after surgeries, more and more doctors and nurses will say, we are going to give you this amount. You should not need any more than that. Go to Tylenol or Advil as soon as you're through. Well, UMass Medical School. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I love UMass, yeah. Um, they've actually implemented a program in non opiate based um, treatment. So they're actually they really? on the forefront of trying to address this. Yeah. So exactly what I was saying. So if you're having surgery and you wake up, they say, look, we're going to send you yeah, home with this script. There's, there's alternatives to, to There's program. an alternative to this. Right. Um, Sounds good to me. I mean, why would you send? I can't imagine why they send you home with thirty pills. You, you know, I was after a day or so, I was fine. You know, the Advil, that's great. It was when the nerve block in the ankle, the leg wore off. I was shooting through the car. <laughs> I was like, now I know why they gave it to me. But maybe today or two, you don't need. But you got to remember how. <laughs> I think this is just one symptom of, or one. Um, recognition of how society is today we want we want everything immediately you know we could be sick we want to get we want to be right better now. instantly um, if you think basically what what is pain pains an indicator tell that you there's something wrong with your body yeah so if you have surgery if you have a medical procedure if you're masking it by a painkiller how do you actually know when your body's starting to heal if it's if you're not on the painkiller you know when the pain starts to diminish <laughs> Senator so, Moore, where are you going to be appearing? That what's coming up for you? Where can people find you? Oh God! You're everywhere, right? <laughs> I yeah. see you everywhere, all the newspapers. Oh, I'm going to be on it. Um, I have another public access show at three o'clock in Shrewsbury. I'll be doing. Oh, good. Okay, uh, I know yeah. them over there. So um, I'll be there. Um, actually, Friday morning I will be at. Um, I will be at the first Hispanic Heritage breakfast that they're having in Worcester. Um, I've got several th things tonight, but they're more politically related, yeah. so I don't know if I want to. Sure. So at the Hispanic event, do you need, uh, I'm being serious, do you have an interpreter with you? Do you have to have somebody there? Is it totally? No, no, no. they'll speak English. They, yeah, they, they'll speak English, yeah. I and think if they, that's awesome. if they do, If they do have anyone there um, speaking yeah. um, Spanish that we need an interpreter, they'll let them say. Before we, before we, um, we end, i got a very important question here for you. Do you think that these children, these immigrant children, are ever going to be reunited with their parents? I think um, I think some no. I th hopefully some will be yes. Tragic. It really absolutely. is. Um, it makes me absolutely cringe. 
to think something like that in our country. If you want to keep them, keep them together. You know, take a child from his parent. I Can you imagine being a child? If they'd taken me from my mom and dad, I would have gone over the dam. I don't know if I could have lived in a cage. Yeah. I don't think I could have. Yeah, yeah and you're right. If, if there's an issue with the background of the parent that you're concerned with, um, yeah. find a facility that they're both going to be... Take them together. Right. You may have, maybe you got them separated in different rooms at different buildings, but at the same location. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in some of them, these kids have been shot all over the country. Yeah, and, and now for us to sit there and say, well, you know, the, yeah. the, the parent was a drug dealer or there's a problem here with this. Yeah. All right, there may have been, maybe there was an issue that we had to deal with. Yeah. But there could have been, until the issue was resolved, yeah. uh, and we could confirm whether uh, they are truly, in fact, um, a, a problem. Yeah. Or, or a danger to the kids, yeah. and at least have them somewhere in the city. It's, so not like, it's just, it, it just is mind blowing. Senator Moore, one last time, how can they reach you? Uh, my office number is 617 722 1485. Uh, my email is michael.moore at masenate.gov. And there you have it. Thank you and for thank being you for with us me. so much. We're going to have him back. You know, these are good topics the Alzheimer's, we got into opioids. We, we ended it about the children that are in the cages. We need to bring them with their families, however else you want to handle it, but bring these children back with they, their mom and dads. One last thing. Yeah. Please remember November 6th to go out and vote. Exactly. Exactly. Get out there and be heard. I've got yes. a 26-year-old son, and I was surprised. He did sign up. He and his buddy, they signed up to vote. I got through to him. You know, I, I got through to him. A lot of the kids, I think, are giving up. Yeah. But he didn't, and he tells me what's going on. We'll talk politics together. That's good. That's well, good. I grew up with it. I think I passed it on to him. Well, you know, what's, what's interesting now is we have, a, uh, after our, um, I'm going to call them teenagers, 18, 19 year olds got the yeah. right to vote, yeah. um, the act actual use of their right gradually went down. Yeah. And since the previous election, um, where you had one of the candidates who was drew out a, the, the younger vote, um, we've seen a resurgence in yes. some of the younger demographic coming out, which I is mean, nice. I thought I was going to have to uh, twist his arm, but uh, nope, he tells me, and he says, I think we are going to be going to the senior center or the city hall or something. He's in Worcester. Okay. Yes. I said, just, just go. Just do what you want to do. Mommy's not going to tell you who to vote for. Do your thing. So you can't sit back and go, you know. Yeah. Thank you for being with us. Oh, my pleasure. Back Thank again. you. We'll see you next time. I'll be my guest. Thank you.